Blue Stool 29, Keith Oppenheim, the man I met in Florida. It was October 1998. I was in Cocoa Beach, Florida. At the time, I was working as a reporter for CNN, doing stories about then Ohio Senator John Glenn, the former astronaut and the first American to orbit the Earth in space. Glenn was making a brief return to NASA. The whole thing was really a publicity stunt for the space shuttle because at age 77, Glenn was about to become the oldest person to travel in space. It was Sunday morning. I had a short break, a few hours before I had to get back to work, enough time to do what I always like to do on Sunday, get the Sunday New York Times. In some places, that's not all that easy, and I ventured out not being sure I was going to get what I was looking for. Then I saw an older gentleman walking down the street. He looked like your typical aging Floridian going for a stroll. He had these huge wraparound sunglasses. He wore sandals over his socks. I said, excuse me, sir, do you have any idea where I could find the New York Times? He graciously smiled and stopped, lifted his glasses to the top of his head and said, well, let me think about that. It was Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite had been the anchor of the CBS Evening News from 1962 to 1981. He was an icon in broadcast journalism. It was not a total surprise to me that I was running into him because CNN had hired him to co-anchor the general coverage of the space shuttle uh, and John Glenn's return to space. But still, I was a little taken aback. After all, I had kind of grown up with him. Every evening at 6.30, my father would chirp news time and expect me to follow to watch the news with him. In my boyhood, during the 1960s, television was just in its second decade. Television news brought the moving pictures of a tumultuous period into our living room. The, assass the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and of course the Vietnam War. Cronkite would eventually be called the most trusted man in America or sometimes just Uncle Walter. My dad adored him. Cronkite was known for his even-handed approach, but there was one time he stepped out of that box that historians call the Cronkite moment. It was early in 1968, after he had done some extensive reporting at, uh, uh, from Vietnam, giving Americans his own view of the raging war. Upon return to his anchor desk in New York, he gave a rare editorial, and in it, he called the war a stalemate, suggesting negotiations instead of war. After the broadcast, President Johnson was reported to have said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. And after that, he decided not to run for re-election. This was, in a sense, my Cronkite moment. As we talked for about where I would buy the paper, I thought about my dad and how great it was going to be to tell him that I am talking to Walter Cronkite, the great man. The moment filled with feelings about my dad and meeting a celebrity is infused with nostalgia. And in a way, nostalgia changes, even distorts, what Cronkite and his era in television news represented. The thinking sometimes goes, that this was a time when broadcast news was in its golden era, far more balanced and far less driven by the forces of commercialism than we see now. And it's worth noting why that nostalgic view is so widely held, probably because there's some truth to it. After all, news divisions were not at first money makers. They existed as part of the broadcaster's role to serve the public interest. Later, as broadcast journalism became a profit center, perceptions began to change. That news and radio, and uh, on television and radio, was not a public service, but a business. One that could shape content to get the maximum number of viewers and boost advertising. By the late 80s, in an era of de deregulation, Congress repealed the Fairness Doctrine, the rule that required broadcasters to give equal time to opposing voices in public affairs programming. It didn't take long for partisan broadcasting to boom. It was no longer the standard to be in the middle. It was okay to take sides. Talk radio, 
Fox News. MSNBC emerged with a sharp take on the stories of the day. As the internet grew and websites, websites evolved into mobile apps, everyone could not only pick from a much wider array of choices, but also could pick the news site or news channel they agreed with. What's happening in our current election may only magnify the sense that our media is overrun by money and manipulation. Consider our debates, we have one tonight, a public forum through which we make decisions about who will become our nominee for president. Audiences for some of these debates have been whopping, or to use the popular line, huge, between 15 and 25 million viewers. When Donald Trump threatens to boycott a debate, he knows something fundamental, that our democracy hinges on a commercial enterprise, in this case, broadcast media, to provide the platform. If Trump doesn't show up, ratings drop. The network makes less. The debate may even be canceled. What option is there for many of us but to be utterly cynical about a process so ripe for distortion? I am not here in front of this blue stool telling you that things are okay, only that they may be a little different than they seem. Problematic as it is to have a commercial system upon which we rely on for information, we are in fact better off with a commercial system. While broadcast media is helped by government supported options like PBS and public radio, it's hard to imagine we would have a more just and informed society if those were the dominant or only forces of information in the electronic media world. The commercial world creates a messy landscape prone to financial pressures and sometimes big mistakes. But it also creates pressure for trustworthy information, something the public demands. Walter Cronkite knew that. He was not a product of an idyllic time. He was the product of the same commercial system in an earlier point in time. His job was not just to deliver the news, but also to get better ratings than his main competitors at NBC and ABC. Was it the same as today? No, I don't think so. But if we are fearful that the more partisan, financially pressured news media system of today creates distortion, we should also be mindful of what could be called nostalgic distortion, that everything was better in the good old days. Journalism has a long history of being filled with opinion, and what we are experiencing now is part of that continuum. However, there might be an important difference. In the 60s and 70s, I don't think I often questioned my news sources. That came later when the number of choices exploded. That's the world you grew up in. You grew up with the internet, with the idea that you have to know whether the source you're getting your information from is reliable or not. Maybe without even realizing it, you were taught to be skeptical. That's a good thing. Skepticism is the base of bringing truth to power. But skepticism alone, without engagement, is not productive. Too often I've heard from students that they aren't voting because they don't know enough, don't care, or everything they hear on the news is hyped or untrue. I can understand the exhaustion, but it's not healthy to be apathetic. In the end, when I think of now versus the age of Cronkite, I don't think, think things were as great then or as bad now. We, you, have tremendous, sometimes highly evolved sources of information to engage with what's happening in the world, and particularly so during this presidential election. You have to determine what's got substance and what does not. In my youth, I don't think we did that as much. Your level of engagement is really more sophisticated, assuming, of course, you do just that, engage. Back in Florida, I could see that it was time to let Mr. Cronkite go on his way. I thanked him and he gave me a pleasant goodbye. Then he shuffled off with his sunglasses and sandals. And I kept on searching because Walter Cronkite could not tell me where to buy the New York Times. Thank you very much.